Welcome to a look at topic 1.8, primary productivity. All living things require energy. That energy is necessary not only for sustaining life, but propagating it via reproduction as well. For practically every living thing on Earth, photosynthesis is the process by which energy is first made available to living things in an ecosystem. It begins with producers, also known as autotrophs, capturing the sun's energy and producing energy-rich compounds like glucose from which the plant can benefit. Of course, when a plant is eaten by an animal, those compounds are transferred to the animal. Since not all ecosystems are equally productive in this respect, the photosynthetic output of different ecosystems can be measured, making it possible to compare them. As a result of nuclear fusion, the sun produces a variety and range of electromagnetic radiation. For example, we can perceive infrared radiation as the sun's warmth. Ultraviolet radiation, thankfully, is mostly blocked by the Earth's ozone layer. But visible light is the range of electromagnetic radiation that we can perceive with our eyes. Based on the wavelength, we perceive different colors of this visible light. Blues, purples, and violets exist in the shorter wavelength, higher energy region, while reds and oranges are found in the longer wavelength, lower energy portion. It is this visible light that plants rely upon for photosynthesis. Of the visible light that reaches the Earth's surface, only a tiny fraction of it is used in powering photosynthesis. Here's why. First, because the primary pigment found in plants is chlorophyll, green wavelengths of light are reflected by plants, and it's the wavelengths in the blue, purple, and red regions that are absorbed, driving photosynthesis. Second, even some of those useful wavelengths of light are reflected by the plant or simply pass right through the leaves without triggering the reactions of photosynthesis. And finally, biochemical processes are not 100% efficient, and photosynthesis is no exception. So what's the result? 20 to 25% of 10 to 11% of 40 to 45% is about 1%. Only about 1% of the sun's visible light that reaches the Earth's surface ends up being used to drive photosynthesis. That 1% of energy that is ultimately captured by producers is called gross primary productivity. About three-fifths of that 1% is immediately used by the plant simply to keep the plant alive. Through cellular respiration, the producer uses its own photosynthetic output to create ATP. The amount that's left over is called net primary productivity, and it is incorporated into the plant's biomass as it grows. It is this net primary productivity that is available to consumers if they were to eat the plant. We already know from a previous topic that the intensity of the sun's energy reaching the Earth's surface varies by latitude and by season. The equatorial and tropical regions are subjected to more intense and consistent solar radiation. During summer months, like July and August in the northern hemisphere, and January and February in the southern hemisphere, more solar energy is available. The photosynthetic output of a region is measured as a multi-unit value. We express it as an amount of energy or biomass increase in producers for a given unit of area over a given length of time. In this chart, for example, we can observe that the savanna's productivity is approximately 3,000 calories per square meter per year. That biome is far more productive than a tundra which, on average, produces only around 500 kilocalories per meter per year. The second chart, as we've seen before, is useful in making the point that, per unit of area, a given ecosystem may not be very productive, but because of the size of the ecosystem, it can be collectively very productive. 
on land, primary productivity is largely the responsibility of grasses, trees, and shrubs. In water, however, nearly all primary productivity is thanks to algae. Algae can be found in nature existing as single-celled organisms, as well as colony forming structures like seaweed and kelp. Algae also forms symbiotic relationships with fungi called lichen and coral. While light travels relatively well through the atmosphere to land-based photosynthesizers, the same cannot be said of aquatic ones. How deep light penetrates into water is a function of its color or wavelength. The less energetic wavelengths, like reds and oranges, don't travel as deeply as the more energetic blues and violets. Producers close to the surface of water that are subjected to the entire range of visible light are like those on land and are primarily green. Therefore, the green wavelengths of light are reflected and the red and blue wavelengths are absorbed and used by photosynthesis. But producers living at greater depths have less light and less variety of wavelengths available to them. So because the main photosynthetic pigment, green chlorophyll, doesn't work as well in deeper water, evolutionary pressure has selected for producers utilizing different photosynthetic pigments. An accessory pigment called phycoerythrin is a great example of this. Phycoerythrin is a red pigment. This diagram here represents the effectiveness of different pigments in driving photosynthesis. If we focus on the chlorophyll A line, we can observe its absorption of violet and blue light as well as orange and red light. Green light, therefore, is almost entirely ineffective for chlorophyll A and photosynthesis. Now compare that to phycoerythrin. Since red and orange don't travel very well through water, the fact that this pigment utilizes blues and greens and a bit of yellow helps explain its effectiveness for photosynthesis and why natural selection favors it in deeper water. That concludes our exploration of this topic, so until the next video, take care.